1982, Public Enemy was formed. It was a hip-hop group that dared to challenge preconceived notions about how music should be delivered to the world. This form of hip-hop inspired a generation of free thinkers to confront authority and question the establishment. One of its members, Professor Griff, also known as the Minister of Information, is still fighting the power today. He joined me earlier to talk about the evolution of hip-hop and the true political power structure of this country. I first asked him about his thoughts on the dysfunctional government shutdown. I think it's um, jockeying for power um, that's not their own, that doesn't even exist. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that, um, that the United States government is a corporation, and the corporation needs to be run by a president, a vice president. And, and the board, and I think that's what's what's going on. I don't think the people on Capitol Hill have our best interests at heart. Well, I couldn't they agree don't. with you more there, uh, Griff. Let's talk about Public Enemy. You were one of the early members of the group, which covered previously taboo topics in music, such as class consciousness, race issues. What was it like to be at the forefront of such a revolutionary musical art form? Um, very exciting, very challenging, to say the least. Um, and then when you're kind of when you're kind of young, kind of growing into it and accepting everything, um, according to our mission, which was only a two-year mission, um, it, it was very critical. I think more challenging uh, than critical because we were interacting with people that we kind of like never had a clue or an idea that we'd be interacting with. You're talking about you know six brothers from the hood in Long Island, New York, and um, taking on issues that ultimately will impact. Uh, the human family throughout the globe. So um, it, was, it was very, very challenging. But, you know, we kind of got through it to walk across the stage and receive the, um, um, the accolades from our peers as far as being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So it, it was a beautiful thing. That is it all, amazing. It, it was worth it. That is amazing. I mean, speaking for a whole generation there, um, and, you know, there's so many prominent hip hop artists today, like Jay Z, that are actively lobbying for Obama. Why do you think so many yeah. rap artists have stopped fighting the establishment and have instead actively joined it? You know, I think they, they try to they try to get along, to kind of go along, just to kind of get along. They they don't want to um, uh, they don't want to cause any waves, so to speak, simply because um, I think they feel they really feel that um, it'll affect their paycheck. Deeper than that, I think there's a fear there of going and, and having to go back and live the way. The majority of us live. Not to say that we we were in a, in a, in a terrible, uh, destitute kind of situation, but they don't want to go back to live and have the daily day-to-day -day grind that you and I uh, may have. Then, on top of that, they don't want to confront the powers that be. They don't want to speak truth to power. Um, and I think it's, they're comfortable um, where they are with some degree of having this illusion of having some degree of, of power, which you and I both know, that's no power at all. Do you think that it's just self-censorship, or do you think that there are certain factors behind the corporatization of the industry and the whitewashing of hip-hop's original message? You know, I always say that um, we are held with the duty and responsibility, regardless of what your complexion is, um, uh, to keep the integrity uh, there in hip-hop, to keep the integrity in music. Um, and, and, and bring it back to its cultural roots and live by those elements that the, for, the founding uh, fathers of hip hop laid out. Um, and I think it's a beautiful thing once we can recognize and understand this. But in order for them to be successful, a certain amount of uh, entertainers have to be on the left. A certain amount of entertainers have to be um, on the right. This middle ground those of us that want to keep the cultural integrity in hip hop, we tend to, uh, we're looked at as though we're the rabble rousers because we bring up issues. Well, if you go back in history and you look at um, any genre and popular genre of music, when it began bubbling up, it was always about these particular, uh, taking on these particular themes and presenting it in the music. I don't care if it's poetry, jazz, um, punk rock, um, um, rock in, in some cases, um, especially uh, with the James Browns of the world and um, definitely with the, uh, the public enemies of the world. Uh, we always brought up these kind of issues um, to be talked about via the music, the social commentary outside of the context of the CD or your album. 
Right, and of course there are tons of hip hop artists that are very revolutionary to the roots, to the core, still in the world today. But of course, what's pushing the mainstream is that dumbed down, uh, you know, advertising to people, um, yeah. kind of that diluted message. And, and you know, even just talking about the quality of music in the mainstream, how do you feel when you watch something like the VMAs and see? That the most popular artists presented are Robin Thicke and Miley Cyrus, represented as the voice of our generation for wow. music. Yeah, when, when I see that, um, red lights are going off in my head. Like, if that is the standard now, <laughs> then from, if from that reference point, where do you go? Right, exactly. I mean, to me, there's so you, much. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying? Wait, but deeper than that, how about all of those that have sacrificed um, of their lives to see that culturally, artistically, we got to this point, to the point where we're respected and we're heard. I mean, I mean, I, I would like to be sitting here with, with Bono from U2 and Chuck D on this side to ask him that same question. Like, where are we going if that's the standard and that's the reference point from which we have to pass back to the uh, next generation coming behind us? This is a sad state of affairs, man. It, it really is, man. I mean, you just hit it right on the head there. It's it's a very sad commentary that that's, that's what should be uh, looked up to, I guess, when really it's just right. horrible music. Let's move on to your stint in the Army. Uh, I heard you talking about it. It was really interesting. You said that you enlisted because you didn't have a choice. Um, talk about what influenced that decision and why the events in Vietnam didn't deter you from signing up. There's not too many options. You can either take to the streets and sling dub sacks, uh, I'm too short and too light in the ass to, to play football or sports. I'm too short to be a basketball player. What other options? I could have taken the academic route, but mom had 12 other children. I said to myself, okay, I like discipline, law, and order. Um, um, I like the, I don't mind being disciplined. I don't like the, di I don't mind the discipline. So I went to, uh, into the military um, and went up onto this program to become a military police because I ultimately wanted to get into child protective service. Got out of the military and even went to a PSTI in Atlanta um, to take this post certification training to become a police officer to get into a child protective service because the children was the thing I had in my mind that was my focus to protect the children. And what was your experience like in the military that kind of changed your opinion about it? Absolutely terrible. Um, I was supposed to do a three-year stretch. I did a, probably about a year and a half and got out because I was taking vaccinations, which I'm uh, starkly opposed to. Um, I'm taking orders from people I didn't respect. Um, and not only that, after studying um, the domestic policy, which is, uh, uh, pardon me, the foreign policy, which is the extension of the domestic policy, I just said to myself, I got to find a way to get out. And Griff, uh, speaking of foreign policy, as a member of the Nation of Islam, how do you feel about the Islamophobia being bred here at home and the war on terror being waged abroad? Ooh, it's, it's critical. And those that are watching that are in the Nation of Islam says, OK, well, Professor Griff hasn't been active in the Nation of Islam for a while, so we kind of make kind of need to make a side note. Um, but um, Islamophobia is, 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 is very critical because even in my lecture that I, that, I, that I give in dealing with the psychological covert war on hip hop, dealing with this whole psychological war, um, in most cases I put up pictures of Muslim women and the way they're dressed next to Christian women and the way they're dressed or supposed to be dressed, and it's the same. Um, a lot of the, the things in, in, in three major religions are common. Uh, they're very common, but the media, uh, multi-ethnic destruction in America, the media, will exacerbate the tensions um, to get us to move one way or the other. It depends on the hidden, uh, the uh, hidden agenda. And I think it's very unfair, simply because uh, we tend to look at people that we probably have more in common with um, than we would ever, ever, ever know if we left it up to the media. Absolutely, we've, we've got to been. The establishment has to demonize the enemy in order to keep those wars churning, uh, Griff. We have about a minute left, and I just wanted to mm -hmm. sum it up by asking you, how can we collectively galvanize the youth? I mean, the youth seem so consumed with escapism, turned off by the inundation of information and the dog and pony show of our political establishment. How can we generate the youth to really fight back and stand up? Starting with you and I in this conversation right now, we have to dare to be different and dare to tell the truth. 
Um, and we have to bring other people around us to that particular reference point. And then we need to take it from there and empower young people with education and information. This is why I'm the Minister of Information. Um, I think once you tell young people and you be straight up with young people and real with young people, young people will gravitate towards it. And um, I think it's our duty and responsibility. Revolution is not an event. It's a process, and we need to understand that. And we need to continue to speak truth to power in everywhere we find young people, wherever they are, whatever medium we need to use, by any, every, and all means necessary. Thank you for speaking that truth to power. Professor Griff, Minister of Information, Public Enemy, amazing to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Oh, give thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone at home, for tuning in tonight. Make sure to join me all over again tomorrow.